traumatic experiences they've had uh, are sometimes very important in shaping the brain and the nervous system and the way it behaves. In other people, it's just not relevant. Either they've not had those experiences, uh, or even if they have, it's not actually that relevant. And other things are more relevant. So I think many clinicians in the field have a much broader view of it. And this is why we want to, I think, move away from the name conversion disorder, which suggests that all patients with this have stress or they're converting stress um, i don't think that's a helpful way of formulating the problem anymore thank you there's another question um it, she asks i have a weak right leg with atrophy of the thigh muscles and a uncoordinated gait the symptoms are constant and slowly progressive is this fnd as i'm newly diagnosed um, well, uh, I don't know if it's FND because you, there, you know, you really need to assess that. You need a neurologist who's familiar with many causes of a weak leg. Um, atrophy is unusual in FND, but does occur. Uh, if someone really is, if someone's not moving their leg at all, then the limb may become thinner. That's what atrophy means than the other side. So I don't know if for that individual, um, it's possible. But there are many causes of a weak leg. You would, you would need to find, find pos evidence of positive signs of FND to make the diagnosis. It's not a diagnosis of exclusion. It's not a diagnosis you make just because tests are normal. Great. The next question um, is: F is need or non-epileptic attack disorder part of FND? Um, it is, yeah. So um, the symptoms, I mean, they're obviously very different symptoms, aren't they? Having an event that looks like a seizure, which is what non-epileptic attacks, or I prefer to call them dissociative attacks or dissociative seizures. That's what that is. That's a very different problem to someone who's got a weak leg. I mean, what they you could argue, all they have in common is they both present to neurologists. Actually, they do have more in common than that because there are people who have seizure-like episodes where they're awake, and that starts to blur into patients who have tremor. If you have a tremor that comes and goes um, of your whole body, is that a seizure? Is that a tremor? Uh, so it is part of FND. Um, but I think uh, I do want to get away from monopoleptic attacks because that's really telling people what they don't have rather than what they do. A question that kind of feeds into what you mentioned is that someone asks when they do feel an attack coming on or an episode of some sort, um, in this case, the person can't move, um, is it the same type of mechanism and should they fight it or should they just let it kind of let it pass and let it be what it is? That's a great question. So that's very common in patients with dissociative attacks and also patients who have recurrent paralysis or current movement disorders will will often not always but often have some symptoms that let them know it's on its way those symptoms are typically symptoms of the body going to red alert um, might be a racing heartbeat might be uh, feeling dizzy or nauseous uh, the dizziness is often a spaced out disconnected feeling which is actually dissociation um, i think if you with guidance, the, the treatment of dissociative attacks and those sort of episodes does involve learning techniques to try and get control back. So what's happening when, you, when the episode is coming is you're beginning to lose control. You're dissociating often from your own body and not, patients will often say it feels as if their body doesn't quite belong to them. So it is helpful often to, to practice distraction techniques in that situation. Uh, but it takes time and is better with guidance. It, it requires practicing over and over again because it's really not easy to do that. Your brain is often screaming at you to shut down and become paralysed, and you're trying to find, trying to push the other way is difficult. And there may be times when it is appropriate to to say, "Okay, I'm just having an episode now, and just wait for it to be over." Thank you. Uh, we have a viewer now that has a, a question. Can it be hereditary? Hi, can it be hereditary? Hi, Rosen. It's, it's a good question. Um, there isn't, it's not something that we see. 
uh, very often. It's, it's, it's certainly not a genetic condition in the same way that, for example, cystic fibrosis or Huntington's career is genetic. Um, I do have some families where more than one family member has FND. And I also have other families where you see patients who've got F one person's got FND and someone else has got a different kind of functional disorder, like fibromyalgia or something like that. I, I would be amazed if there isn't some genetic component to this condition. I think everyone who works in it would expect that there would be, but it's not something you can, that, that, that you're going to pass on to your children um, or that you need to have, and there's certainly no sort of genetic test for it. So a vulnerability to functional disorders probably does run a bit in families. Um, but I think the chance of a, of a direct family member having FND is, is actually very small. Thank you. I know a lot of people do. Um, that comes up a lot in our Facebook pages and the questions. Yeah. Uh, we have another question here. Can you discuss treatment options, especially in the pediatric population? Okay, well, treatment options, I mean, that it covers the whole of treatment. I mean, treatment has to begin with, I think, a with a with a medical with health professionals who understand the diagnosis who can help people and help the patient and their family understand it and that's you know when i when i look after patients in that population i think it's important for the for the child as well to understand it they can you know, there's no reason why it can't be gone through with them once you've got that I think you're then it really depends on the symptom so for motor symptoms such as weakness or movement disorder um, I think physiotherapy is probably the first um, first treatment of choice for patients having seizures I think psychological treatment to help learn techniques to avert the seizure is the treatment of choice often you're looking you, you need a multidisciplinary team in that setting because you need someone to liaise with the school um, you need uh, you might need an occupational therapist um, so it is a difficult question to answer that because it does depend on the problem there is there is less research in children as well um, but I think many of the things that we know about treating adults are, are are just as applicable in children from talking to colleagues who work in the area thank you it is quite difficult because I know we have a lot of parents that reach out to us and there's not a lot of um, doctors that are focusing on those that have um, probably under the 18 or even under 16 years old um, and any any treatment centers that you know of that you could gear people to or do you know of any specialty ones that you feel comfortable well, with? Yeah I mean I, I don't want if I pick out certain in places it might be unfair to, to ones that I'm not so aware of so but there are there are, I mean, Great Ormond Street is the obviously the, the most famous children's hospital in the UK, and they certainly have a professor there who's got an interest, particularly in seizures. And, they, and I know they look after some very sick uh, children and adolescents with FND as well. So, but I'm sure there are, there are others too. I'm not, it is, it is a less developed area, but, um, and sometimes the emphasis has to be a bit different because the patients at school and, uh, the, 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 the person's developing, etc. So it is. A, it, it does require some different approaches, of course. Um, but there are. It is worth trying to find someone. You know, ask ask your pediatrician about uh, how confident they feel about this condition. Do they feel that someone else might be able to help? That sort of thing. All right. Thank you. We have. We're going to kind of change um, course here. We have another question that's come in. It says, I've seen some information that multiple chemical sensitivities may be linked to FND. Is this true in your opinion? And do you know if non-IgE mediated food intolerances, allergy symptoms can be caused by FND or be the cause of FND? Okay. So I think my view there is that we, I, I see many patients who have uh, food intolerance and also they tend to have drug sensitivity as well. And um, I th my, my view about that is that, we're, is that the cause of multiple chemical sens sensitivity, it's kind of in the name, it's a sensitivity of the nervous system. It's, 
which is actually, I think, best seen as, as a functional disorder of the nervous system. So that, so that so the nervous systems become abnormally sensitive. Um, and so it's not that uh, chemical sensitivity causes FND. I think it's just that people who have find that they're very sensitive to certain foodstuffs or chemicals are suffering usually, I think, from a functional disorder. And so therefore they are also vulnerable to getting a functional neurological disorder. Um, the other question is about IgE. I think that, well, that was sort of really to do with intolerance, so non-IgE intolerance, yeah. So intolerance, again, is common in patients with irritable bowel, uh, which syndrome, which is also a functional disorder. I think, I think when patient, people hear that, they often think, oh, you're just, dis you're just dismissing the whole thing as functional disorders, you know. Um, and what I would say to that is stop being so rude about functional disorders. They are genuine conditions. And it's more helpful to be, uh, it's, I think it's helpful sometimes to see these all as one condition. That, that having functional disorder in general can present in many different ways. And patients with FND often have other functional uh, other symptoms which are not strictly within FND which really just describes neurological symptoms like weakness or uh, tremor or seizures but, but it's more common than not for patients to have pain fatigue other bowel problems bladder problems sensitivity problems these aren't always due to functional disorder but they very commonly are and it's important to see the whole have to see the patient as a whole I think with all of those things and Dr. Stone, I think you made a really, you touched on a really good point kind of in the conversation. And, and it's something that many of our viewers find um, to be a problem. And one of the questions is that why do doctors think that you're making it up and it's all, all mental health? Yeah. Well, there's a particular reason, I think, in FND, why doctors particularly think that. It's because the symptoms that patients have involve the voluntary nervous system so um, they are symptoms that can be mimicked so if someone pretended to have a weak leg um, they it might look like fnd not not all of the symptoms can be mimicked but they they are many of them could be a bit and so for people looking at them traditionally doctors have thought well is that a genuine condition or is that someone is that someone pretending to have that symptom well, not now i know that patients are not because all you have to do is talk to patients to find out that it's a genuine condition and particularly you know over decades of doing so that's it's very obvious there's that problem and then there's the bigger problem in functional disorders in general is that these are not conditions that you can see on a scan or you can see on blood tests and so there's often a fight you know the doctors say well there's nothing on the tests and it's almost as if the doctor needs, an, a doctor or patient needs an abnormal test to feel that it's a genuine condition or feel believed. I don't need an abnormal scan or test to believe a patient. I don't need that if, if a patient of mine has migraine. I don't need a scan to believe that patient. And I don't need it for a functional disorder either. But many doctors are very stuck in this model of, um, you know, there's only one, you know, the only genuine sort of condition is one that you can see on a scan. That's the kind of genuine bit. I mean, you asked about why is it a mental condition as why is it considered mental as well? I think um, that's a, that's another topic altogether. So maybe I'll I'll stop there and let someone else speak. Well, I you know I we've got another question here, and and they mentioned somatoform disorder, and that they still can't understand what what that is and that is a common question that comes up in our facebook pages quite frequently is you know conversion disorder functional neurological disorder somatoform disorder there's so many terms that are used that can't be agreed upon um that it leaves our viewers really kind of confused on where they fit in all this um can you lend any clarity to that yeah okay i mean What's happened really is to do with history and the history of these disorders. So a long time ago, 100 years ago, they were called functional disorders. It's not a new name. Somatoform disorder, con conversion, somatization, psychogenic, all of these terms 
come about from a, a, where because doctors have come have come to the view that these are conditions that should be thought as psychological or that the psychological stress is causing symptoms what would what's happening at the moment I and mean, the reason there's confusion out there is that we've got some doctors who still really feel that that's the case and feel that these are the these are best seen as psychological disorders and you've got others including myself who are not saying that psychological factors should not be assessed and are not important everyone's a human being but actually let's have a broader view of these and let's not jump to conclusions about psychological factors so patients are often caught in the middle of those different points of view um, I would say that the researchers in the field of this are, are would would be in sort of my camp mainly, and that it's a bit it's becoming much more old school to um, to see these things as as purely psychogenic. But but there but there's the problem, and I don't and and it's difficult for patients, and I know that. But I do think look thinking about these as functional disorders has actually helped things move forward. You know, we never would be having this webinar tonight um, there was no there was no patient community at all until um, until you started FND Hope Bridget and that was what five six years ago I think I think things are changing and I, I would ask patients people to sort of try and be patient and try not to get too angry with their doctors when they um, talk like that or behave like that because they was that was probably what they were taught at medical school um, and we're we're trying to do something new here with the whole with the whole area. Uh, thank you for that because I think it is so important for so many patients that have been told um, alternative reasons why they are experiencing illness. We have a question here that someone asks: is, Are they sick because of a low willpower? And I think that just shows some of the theories that are out there and that are still being still being perpetuated. And as you mentioned it's it was how they were taught and it, it's important that we continue these type of webinars and educate patients um so they they know that's not the case i think on the plus side on the plus side i would say that i see a big change uh occurring amongst certainly in british neurology um towards these conditions i i ran a second i ran a special interest group um, at our annual meeting last week and a 17 neurologist came the many many young neurologists who who want to be positive about these conditions who want to provide treatment can see that actually it's actually a very uh, rewarding part of their job to be able to diagnose and treat FND and that it doesn't have to be the way it's been which is often you know doctors being uh, rude to patients or jumping to conclusions, patients getting very upset. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. We can treat FND in the same way that we treat migraine, multiple sclerosis, just as another condition that we see. And I think that there has been quite a bit of change. I know I've seen change over the past five years. I can understand where someone may be just coming into the diagnosis because there's still so far for us to go that they may not see where we've come from. But I, I do commend you and um, several of the other doctors that are making that change. And, and the change that has occurred is because of your guys' efforts. And so I think that that is important that we recognize where we have come from as well as where we're going. Yeah, I think it's easy to forget. You know, when I, when I started in the late 90s, the, some of the places I trained, uh, these patients with FND were totally ignored and they were basically accused, they were all accused of being malingerers. And it's one of the reasons that I got, I I got into this field was because I thought, well, that's not true. You know, that's clearly not the case. And I could see that the, the problem was that the, that the neurologists looking after them didn't really know what to do. They had been no research. They hadn't had any training. So we were starting from a very low base. So things have changed. I appreciate people are having, or, or having awful experiences on a regular basis, but things are changing overall, I'd say. Go ahead. With your, we have a viewer that has a question. 
Um, the question is really, once you've been diagnosed with FND, how do you go about accessing help and treatment? Yeah, I think, well, when that happens, what you need is your, you need a health professional to be helping you, don't you, to, got, to access treatment. Um, ideally, that is, starts with the neurologist who's made the diagnosis and who would cons think what would be the best treatment for this person. Do they need physiotherapy? Do they need, just, would psychological therapy be helpful? Um, does, is, does medication have a role? Um, it's a, it needs a multidisciplinary team. And I'm aware that in many places, patients are still sort of falling through the cracks of the system. So they see a neurologist, the neurologist makes the diagnosis, doesn't see the patient again. You know? And that's, that's a problem, isn't it, for the patient? Um, so again, it does, it does depend on your particular symptom, but that if you're in the UK, it sounds as if you're in the UK, there are uh, FND clinics popping up all over the place now, which is great to see. So, you know, in um, London and Bristol and Cambridge and Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dundee, there are specialists um, in most cities now, not all. So I think it's about accessing someone, a health professional. It might not be a neurologist either. It might be a neuropsychiatrist. Accessing someone who is interested in your condition and wants to help. I want to also just mention that a lot of these others that are popping up, you've been working with them. It's, there's, there's not, I think sometimes people think there's a sort of competition between doctors and, and maybe in some areas there are, but there definitely seems to be a collaborative network that you guys are working together. And um, that's part of what we were trying to do with our awareness campaign was help other people realize that there are more doctors out there trying to help them. Um, and you feel quite confident in some of those efforts. So I think, um, one of the last questions that we want to ask, I, I can't tell if we've kind of lost me or, um, oh, or Dr. Stone. Maybe, but the, something funny's happened to the, the, the chat. Oh, there we go. I was going to say, I'm not sure if it was me or you. Um, we're, we're really coming to an end um, of, our, of our time anyway. And so, um, like I said, I, I think we're kind of losing Dr. Stone and... Um, so that might be all we can do. Uh, we really appreciate everyone who has joined us here today. And um, we really appreciate Dr. Stone and the time that he gives us to help patients and to help really move the ball forward. 